Huskies had a great pro day yesterday. A few key names to talk about here. We're going to start with Michael Penix Jr. Bringing on Huskies insider Christian Capel. You can subscribe to Christian's coverage of the Huskies at onmontlake.com and listen to him right now on the Emerald Queen Casino Sportsbook Hotline. Hey, Christian, how's it going? Happy Friday. Hey, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to start with Michael Penix Jr. He was generating a lot of buzz, Christian, mostly over a very speedy 40, really impressive showing uh, at his pro day. What stood out to you just physically with what he was doing, how he looked? Uh, and then I got a few more questions afterwards, but tell me about that. Yeah, maybe uh, out here in this part of the country, we take it for granted because we've watched him up close and seen him uh, seen him throw the ball in, in games a number of times. And so, hey, yeah, he's that's just Michael Penix Jr. throwing the football. That's what it looks like, right? But um, obviously with that much NFL personnel on hand and all the scouts and evaluators and everything watching him throw, um, it's just another reminder that, you know, hey, this is maybe the most special uh, passing arm that has ever come through the University of Washington. And um, this is another chance for, for NFL scouts to get a look at that. Obviously the, the 40 stood out depending on kind of what time you want to latch on to. There were some some really fast times thrown out there and then some kind of like you mentioned that were more in the mid four fives closer to four six range he didn't seem real satisfied with it he, he said he considers himself a four four guy and so anything that's not in uh in in that range he's he's not pleased with and you know he had a 36 and a half inch vertical leap which would have been the the best mark i think at the nfl combine among quarterbacks this year and said even that he's like well i wanted 38 so um, obviously holds himself to a high standard, but yeah, like, questions about his athleticism, I think, because he is, you know, such a, has been such a pure pocket passer in college. So people were kind of curious, you know, what is his straight line speed and his burst look like? And, you know, if there was any question about it, it's, it's pretty good. So I think, I think he did prove that at least. What's the advantage of running on a pro day rather than running at the combine? I, I would imagine maybe you're going off a of hand time. So there's room for error rather the combine, there's uh, there's lasers. Um, what's, what's your, uh, I guess, um, viewpoint on that? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, there's so much else going on at the combine. Maybe that's that's just one more thing that you don't need to worry about if you're not going to run it there. Um, it's one less thing to really put in that that real focus preparation for in the lead up to that event, and, and also. He's a quarterback, right? Is the 40-yard dash the most important thing in the world? Maybe it is better, kind of like you mentioned, that wait till the pro day, run. There's not this, you know, definitive official time attached to you. There's a little bit of mystery around it. And if it's if it's good, you know, hey, if someone throws out 446 on Twitter and it gets slapped on a big fancy graphic and uh, gets halfway around the world before maybe some of the slightly more accurate ish times come through that 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 helps you too but um you know i i think the combine is such an event there's so much going on and you're preparing to answer all these questions and obviously he threw there too um you know maybe it's just it's easier to get that all out of the way and then make a a a little um more informed decision about whether you're going to run or not uh, several weeks after that Hey, uh, there's been conversations about whether Michael Penix, who's typically been grouped kind of with Bo Nix, will fall into that second round territory or whether there might be a quarterback needy team that trades back up into the first or takes him or Bo later in the first. Either way, neither have been profiled as top five picks, but the question of whether Michael Penix has kind of cemented himself as a first rounder after the pro day is what we were talking about earlier today, Christian. Bump has a theory that the Cowboys could be there at 24 and take him. Do you see him being a late rounder to a team like that? I wouldn't be surprised. I I think he threw so, I mean, first of all, his film is what it is, right? I mean, he's um, incredibly accurate down the field. You know, he's, he's got great arm strength and great touch, uh, especially on longer throws. You've watched him do it for two seasons at Washington, injury free and all that. And then, at the combine and at his pro day, um, he's looked every bit of that, right? I think he probably showed every single thing that, that you could want just in terms of an arm talent perspective um, for evaluators. So it does seem like his stock has only improved since this draft process started. I think getting through the medical process at the combine without really any red flags leaking out, I mean, kind of seemed like, right, there was a report that the, that was that was sort of a good news um, deal for him coming out of that. So 
I, I wouldn't be surprised. I never know. You know, it, it seems like um, the the speculation and, you know, us in the media talking about prospects can set people up to think a, a certain range is more likely than others when maybe that's not entirely informed by what the, the teams and the people making the picks are thinking. So I, I never quite know what to make of that. I know what I watched the last two seasons, and if he's not a first-round quarterback, I don't know what more he really could have showed to to be that. You know, again, aside from maybe some things out of his control, like being hurt at Indiana um, for four seasons, but um, yeah, I I wouldn't be at all surprised to see him go late in the first. Not necessarily expecting it guaranteed, but um, I that that wouldn't shock me. I think he's that kind of player. Obviously, Michael Penix um, was the headliner when it comes to UW's Pro Day. But did you um, – any other names stick out? Anybody else um, do their thing in front of these scouts? Yeah, you know, with such a huge combine class, it was a little bit – it was a little bit of a different Pro Day because there are so many scouts there and there's so many big names and there's going to be a handful of first-rounders. But, you know, those guys, um, you know, got a lot done at the combine, right? So I, I think, you know, maybe – looking at the lower end of the draft a little bit. Jack Westover was a guy who missed the combine. You know, he, he attended the combine, but wasn't able to work out because he was recovering from thumb surgery and um, was far enough past that that he was able to, to work out and caught passes from Penix. And so, you know, maybe it was a chance for him to just show, hey, you know, no, no um, uh, ill effects from the surgery. And, and he, he caught the ball just fine. And that that was, you know, something that was behind him and not, not something for teams to worry about. So, you know, Braylon Trice um, talked about showing up at the Combine at 255 and then getting a little bit of a stomach bug that had him weigh in at 245 and didn't say he was just sick, didn't feel good, didn't, you know, felt like he um, didn't put forth his best performance there and, and said he's back up to about 259 and um, feeling better and went through drills and he said he, he felt good about the way he was moving. So, um, you know, maybe he he answered some questions and got that uh, that combine performance out of people's minds a little bit too. I've seen so many national folks mock Troy Fautanu to Seattle. I think there's that Washington connection that already exists, but I also think that the Seahawks are typically seen as a team that has a weaker offensive line, often fairly. And even though they have two tackles, I think people see Fautanu as being, you know, pretty flexible. Do you think that he can rotate to that guard spot effectively? In the NFL, do you see him being a mid-round pick? Uh, tell me a bit about Troy. Yeah, I think he's the kind of guy who's willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, he played some guard at Washington. In fact, I I don't know that tackle was necessarily like his ultimate destination in Scott Huff's eyes when he got there. Certainly, you looked at him and thought he could. That was that was something he could do. But when he was good enough to start for them. Jackson Kirkland was coming back as their left tackle and Fautani moved out to tackle for their first three games because Kirkland was coming off injury. But then when he was healthy, it was Jackson Kirkland at left tackle and Troy Fautani at left guard. And after a couple of weeks of that, they kind of figured out that, Hey, I, I think the, the best move going forward is probably to, to swap Troy back out to left tackle and, and kick Jackson Kirkland inside a guard. And, that was what they rolled with for the rest of 2022. And obviously um, Bautano was, was the guy there at left tackle last year. So you know, I think he was obviously an elite left tackle in college. I think he's athletic enough and showed that at the combine. And, and again, in some of his drills at pro day that if you needed him to play out on the edge in the NFL, I think that's something that he could do, but I, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't see any issue with him moving inside to guard. I mean, he's a, from what I know of him, he's a team first guy. I don't think he's going to demand to play any particular position. And, you know, the, the person, if, if he did go to the Seahawks at 16 specifically, the person who'd be making that decision is someone who's really familiar with his skill set. So um, I, I, I would not be surprised if, if he was someone who could transition to, to play inside in the pros. It's kind of like a, a weird kind of state of you to football. You got – your former offensive coordinator with the Seahawks. I would assume there were Seahawk representatives there. Um, you got a new head coach in Fish. Uh, were was was everybody there? Was Fish there? Was Grub there? Like what was what was the 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 family reunion like over there in the pro day? Yeah, it was Michael Penix said that uh, Ryan Grub actually texted him ahead of time and told him he wouldn't be there because he's in Hawaii. So he was uh, he he did not attend. But yeah, Fish was Fish was there and. 
Um, Chris Peterson was out there. You know, of course, he – Troy Fautanu was in that 2019 class that Peterson recruited. And, um, you know, Odunze and McMillan and Rosengarten, you know, they're part of the 2020 class who all committed to play for Chris Peterson but never actually got to. So, he he, he knows a lot of those guys. And, um, yeah, it would have been <laughs> – would have been interesting to see Grub interact with with Penix and Odunze, who he was there, but of course didn't didn't work out, didn't really need to after the combine. But yeah, Penix was he he kind of he kind of laughed, cracked a smile when he when he said that. He was like, oh okay, coach is uh, coach Grub is uh, is uh, enjoying the sunshine a little bit. For onmontlake.com, you wrote that Washington hiring Pat Chun reminded you of a cold-blooded decision made previously a certain morning in August. Um, tell us a bit about your reaction to Washington hiring Chun and what that press conference was like. Yeah, I wasn't surprised at all. I mean, by the time the news came out, I think if you you moved on from – Wow, Troy Dannon's moving Washington. Move, uh, Troy Dannon's leaving Washington to okay. Now who, who's Washington going to go get next? Pat Chun was a pretty natural choice to put at the top of any list of candidates, and it sounds like he probably would have been there for Washington six, seven months ago when they hired Troy Dannon, um, if not for the the Ohio State AD job being open. And obviously, everybody knows Pat Chun's history with Ohio State. He went to school there. He worked there for 15 years. He's always kind of been viewed as a a, a top candidate to, to work there if there's ever an opening, but um, you know, it, it, it's college athletics is at a point where nothing's really sacred, right? Like I, I think maybe five years ago, would Washington have gone and hired the AD at Washington state? You know, I don't know. They definitely wouldn't have, but uh, I think anymore, if you're going to move, make the move to the big 10, if you're going to say, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to, to move this institution and and contribute to the disintegration of the Pac-12, um, you better make every decision after that with winning and competing at the highest level in mind. Otherwise, what was it for? You know. So I think that's kind of how they approached it. And you know, Pat Chun obviously is has a, a great reputation within college athletics. He's very connected, and you know, his is a a, a popular name. And you know, um, I think the fact that he was just across the state and familiar with the region and all those things just kind of made it a, it made it make a lot of sense aside from the fact that uh, he did leave Washington State for the one school that um, you know, more so than any point in their history they've they've been at odds with since August here. How do you view Washington's role in the disintegration of the Pac-12? <sighs> yeah, I mean they're certainly part of it, right? Like it's it's hard to put it on any one school and if you're going to i think you probably start with usc and then ucla off of that they're the ones who made the decision to go first and that really came out of nowhere i mean nobody had any idea that was happening and that was a bombshell and then even in that the saga you know that that saw washington and oregon go to the big 10 colorado jumped first right to the big 12 and um then it was kind of every every school for themselves at that point but the fact is you know if washington had found the apple plus deal amenable if they'd said hey let's just take a run at this keep the league together it does seem like you know them and oregon could have gotten on the same page and and kept those nine together and then maybe you expand at that point san diego state obviously was in play smu was in play um and you keep the league together for at least a couple years going forward but there's also a sense of, you know, kind of delaying the inevitable there too, right? Like, well, what's it going to look like two, three years down the road when there's an opt-out clause in this thing and realignment isn't done in college sports. So um, I certainly, they, they had a role and, and obviously, um, you know, Washington state's future and fate were not really part of their consideration.